Welcome to the last part of this week two cognitive psychology perception lecture. It will be about object recognition. So I have no clue what that object is, but it looks quite good to illustrate object recognition and its importance. So object recognition is about recognizing objects and identifying objects, identifying what they are useful for, and things like that. So that we can say, okay, this is a cup, or this is a plate, or this is a bicycle, or whatever. So it's a very central purpose, actually, of our perception, because um, we need to be able to decide, are the objects harmful? So objects could also be uh, animals, for instance, um, and whether it might be useful to use as a tool. How can we utilize it? We know how our effectors, our hands you work, so can we use it somehow? So we need to be able to identify objects because uh, then we can select and perform the proper actions with them. If we think in the wrong way of objects, then it might be actually dangerous. So think about little children who have to learn how to use scissors, for instance. Okay, so how does the recognition of objects work? And one person who really uh, uh, proposed a major theory here is Irving Biedermann. We have seen that the Gestalt principles described a lot of object recognition, if you think like the law of continuation and things like that. They described it, but they didn't explain it. And Biedermann proposed a theory which is called the recognition by component, or short RBC theory, and I think you will hear about this in biological psychology as well. But we here mainly focus on the cognitive aspects of that theory. And actually the paper by Biedermann where he proposed that theory is today's additional reading which you might want to look into. Okay, before we turn to Biedermann's theory, we will take a step back, because Biedermann based his theory on a theory proposed by David Marr, who unfortunately passed away way too early, I think by leukemia or something like that, and uh, he was just 35 years old. So, his theory was, suppose we see an image like that, which is like a plush rabbit, and he proposed that the processing of that object happens in several stages. The first stage is what he called a full primal sketch, where, like the primary visual cortex basically would do, we identify contours and very basic shapes like blobs here, or here for the eyes, things like that. Then this full primal sketch is transformed into what he termed a two and a half dimensional sketch. So basically this full primal sketch gets added spa uh, spatial or depth information. But this information is in so-called egocentric presentation. Egocentric means it's focused on myself. So, if I move in relation to the object, my representation of the object changes. And then, in the last step, it's put into a three, full three-dimensional model, which is in an allocentric space. That means, if I have a representation of the object, even if I move, the representation of the object doesn't change, although my viewing angle changes. And this representation he proposed, and that's one of the key ideas Biedermann took over to his model, is that um, objects are represented by so-called primitives, which um, stand for the surface and, and the volume. And in the most basic concept, these primitives are just like cylinders. So a human is represented by a hierarchical organization of cylinders. And if you say the arm is one cylinder, you can break that down into the upper arm and lower arm. You can break that down into cylinders like that. And then you can break down the hand into a major cylinder and then smaller cylinders. And you can go even smaller. 
Now Biedermann took over this idea but refined um, the concept of using cylinders for that. And he said that every object can, on a gross, gross scale, described by a combination of basic geometric shapes. And he called these basic shapes geons, as geometric ions. Now let's have some example of that. He proposed there are 36 different geons or primitives, he called them as well. Okay, so these geons represent objects by combining them. So these are examples of the geons or primitives like a cube or a wedge or a pyramid or a cylinder like Mar used. And here are examples of how complex everyday objects can be composed of variations of that. So you can say a cylinder which is quite tall and maybe squashed a little bit or squeezed a little bit uh, or this one is a uh, expanded cylinder makes this shape here and so forth. Now a key, these are just other example, a key idea is that you use or humans or the human mind has a representation of the geon and then can just reuse that in different objects. So a suitcase and a cup may both have this handle-shaped geon but with different parameters about size and where it is attached to the object. So the idea is that this indefinite set of objects which exist in the human world can be described by a small set of basic geometric shapes. And that makes object recognition feasible or that our mind can handle it and doesn't have to be able to memorize and represent literally billions of different objects which we may perceive but instead they are broken down into components which help us to to do that. Another example and I just present that here because he used stimuli like that in his experiments is that you have complex things like a plane which is then built up of geons like the wing and the main body and things like that so you can also represent things like that with these elements. And remember these are just a selection. He proposed 36 of them. Okay, so the experimental evidence you really have to pay attention to follow the logic. They are slightly complicated. Um, so what he did was kind of priming experiments where he presented a stimulus like that and used that as a basis and then removed information from that stimulus and showed them only partially, like here. So he showed that as a kind of a prime stimulus, then there was a blank screen and then they saw a second stimulus and this one was always mirror reversed to the one they have first seen and what they had to decide was is that the same like this one or is it a different exemplar he said so is it basically the same plane or a different type of plane because it's mirror reversed you can't do a very simple straightforward perceptual matching you need a representation of that plane to be able to do that task and then they have to just say yes or no on the different one or same different and then the next try comes up and then they see a different combination next try comes up a different plane different combination and so forth and this goes on for quite a while okay so let's have a look at the different conditions he used to support the idea that we represent objects in the form of geons and the first experimental condition he used is the following. So this is an example of the first stimulus they see, the prime. And this can be followed either by this, by that, or by this. So three different conditions here. 
and the first one is it's identical so it's exactly this one just mirror reversed C stands for complement that means this image is A mirror reversed and B it shows all the lines which have been removed here so if you mirror reverse that and move those two over each other they come up to this and DE is different exemplar so this is just a different plane okay now the crucial manipulation is that here here and here in all versions all the relevant geons can be identified so it always allows us to say there's the geon for the wing here it's different parts it's this this and this part of the g wing which is shown while in this image it's this part of the wing which is shown so you see different lines but the lines are sufficient to identify the geon of the wing and this is just a different exemplar which has different geons so in the response times of this task where they have to say same or different what he found that this one and this one result in the same response times roughly and that's it's faster than here because here you don't have the priming of this stimulus so even though this and these have completely different lines so for a computer it would look like completely different images you get a perfect priming effect which is the same as using the identical lines okay so this is the first part of the story only the second part of the story is he did a similar thing but he chose different lines to remove it's the same amount of lines which are removed but now they are removed in a way that complete geons are removed so in this version it's get the identical just mirror reverse you have all the geons which are relevant to see the main body of the plane but the geons of the wings are missing so in the complementary version you see that the body is missing but you see the wings so that <clears throat> it is um, okay I'm sorry I was briefly interrupted so here as I said the same number the same amount of lines is removed but um, now complete geons are removed so that this one has different geons to this one while on this side they both represented the same geons and this again is just a different exemplar a different plane now what happens now in the response times is that the response times for these two are the same and they are slower than this one so it's the identity of the plane is not the relevant thing here it's the geons which is relevant so we actually seem to use break down scenes and objects into these geons and if the prime contains the geons we need for the task it's helpful but if it doesn't like here it's not helpful so this is a very strong support for his theory and of course you can do that with many other stimuli not only planes um, as well so even animals would be represented in that way according to Biedermann with this schematic illustration of a cow <clears throat> okay so to summarize object recognition it's really a key part of visual perception it works in stages so we start very basic with edge detection or something but then quickly try to form these edges and so forth into basic basic geometric ions into geons and to have that and to work with this MRI and imaging research 
has shown that this stage is actually localized in the lateral occipital cortex. So it was possible to identify even in the brain where these geometrical units, the geons, are localized. I would like to say that, um, to add to this, that Biedermann's theory um, was had quite a bit of impact because at the time when it was proposed, it was a little bit unclear how objects are represented in the brain. And there was this big discussion of, you may have heard of that grandmother cell, or in newer versions, the, I think, Jennifer Aniston cell, where the idea is every object we know has its own little representation in the brain. So a couple of neurons um, represent the computer mouse you may have at work, and another couple of neurons represent the computer mouse you have at home, another set of neurons represent um, the keyboard, and so forth. And Biedermann proposed, no, it's all a big network of, um, of neurons which represent different aspects and shapes, these geons, and depending on the object, you link together different parts of that network. And it's the holistic activity in this network which tells you, I have this aspect like a handle, I have this aspect like a body, and combines that together to the percept. So that it's a more distributed representation of memory content. And although there are some speculations still about these, this idea that it might be important or relevant or also play a role that individual cells, so to say, represent something, the overwhelming majority of scientists believe it's this representational approach. And Biedermann proposed and found support for this idea when, from the neuroscience perspective, this wasn't really fully clarified because people couldn't um, measure to that level of detail or had didn't, at least didn't have done it at this time. Okay, as usual, questions go onto the BBL forums, please. Okay, thanks a lot. This was the last part for the, uh, this week's lecture on perception in cognitive psychology and next week we will speak about attention. Okay, thanks a lot for watching and hope to see you in the seminars. Bye-bye.